different types of shock. Now let us identify the type of shock. In other diseases, we go for a history, clinical examination, after that we go for investigations, then make a diagnosis and finally treat the patient. We have time for everything. In shock, it is not like that. Everything has to start simultaneously. We have to take the history of the patient, we have to start resuscitation, we institute, we do the investigations in between. So that is what is happening in a case of shock. And during that cacophony, how will we identify that type of shock? Of course, we go by the method of ATLS protocol, airway, then go for a breathing, circulation, disability, and we expose the patient and we remove the patient from the environment. And everybody, they low, each team will be doing one thing, one, one or two persons will be looking the airway, another sister and another person may be looking for the circulation like that. So data will be flowing from all the side. Airways pattern, there is air and rain, heart sounds are heard. So data will be flowing from every side. So how will we make a diagnosis of the type of shock in case of, in a scenario like that? So in shock, we do a resuscitation. Then we have to identify the cause of a shock and then go for a definite treat, definitive treatment. So how to identify? For that, we have to understand certain hemodynamic parameters. We are uh, invoking the earlier model for shock. That is, this corresponds to the prelo, the corresponds to the venous pool. Here it is the lung and the right heart. The blood is coming to the right heart and going to the lung. And from the lung, the blood is returning to the left ventricle, which is the motor. And then it is going to the iota, which is the uh, where there is peripheral vascular resistance. So that is a model with the hemodynamic parameters which we are going to look into are the central venous pressure, preload, cardiac output, and systemic vascular resistance. Coming to the central venous pressure, pressure. The central venous pressure is measured in the superior vena cava. A catheter is put and we measure the central venous pressure. So that will give us the idea regarding the amount of blood in the venous pool. So a catheter is put towards the central vein and we, we with the help of a manometer, we identified the amount of central venous pressure. Now coming, how what is preload? How exactly is preload identified? If we look at the left ventricle, the amount of stretch the left ventricle goes or the amount of fluid in the amount of blood in the left ventricle is exactly the preload that will give us an understanding of the preload to identify that we have to either go through the iota and measure it or we have to go through the pulmonary art, pulmonary vein and measure it that will not be easily accessible so how will we identify how will we identify the preload or how will we get an indication regarding preload for that you we use a pulmonary artery catheter so, pulmonary artery occlusion pressure or pulmonary artery wedge pressure is to be uh, identified to understand the preload. Let us see how it is. So, we advance our central line. So, we use a pulmonary artery catheter. If we advance the catheter into the right atrium, we get a right atrial tracing. If we advance it to the right from the right atrium to the right ventricle, we get the right ventricular pressure tracing. And from there, if we go into the pulmonary artery from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery, then we get the pulmonary artery pressure tracing. And if we take it into a smaller branch of the pulmonary artery and we inflate the balloon, then we get the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure or pulmonary artery wedge pressure. What is the use of that? You see, if when we keep the balloon into a smaller branch, what happens? This is the pulmonary artery bringing the deoxygenated blood into the alveolar capillaries, oxygenated and it is going through the pulmonary venule with the oxygenated blood towards the left ventricle okay so this is the pulmonary artery deoxygenated blood is coming capillary pulmonary capillaries and it is going through the pulmonary venule finally to the left ventricle suppose we are occluding with the help of this pulmonary catheter one of the smaller pulmonary vein pulmonary arteries what happens we are inflating the balloon so once we inflate the balloon here the all this pressure from the right ventricle, all this pressure from the pulmonary artery, nothing is going to reach the sensor. The, sens of the, uh, the balloon is inflated, so no pressure is transmitted from here towards the sensor. The sensor is lying here. Okay. The only pressure is trans transmitted is the pressure from the capillaries, from the distal pulmonary arterioles and from the distal pulmonary venules. So this pressure is an indicator of how much the left ventricle is filled. filled. The filling of the, the pressure in the pulmonary capillaries and the pulmonary arterioles and the pulmonary venules will be according to the pressure in the left ventricle. The back pressure will be lower. Okay. So, that is how the pressure will be. So, this pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will give an indication in towards the left ventricular pressure or the preload. That is like 
Suppose this is the right ventricle and there is a lot of cacophony, the pressure is going. When the balloon is inflated, the father and mother is fighting. When the balloon is in inflated, the door is closed. The child does not have to suffer no more, The does not want to hear the uh, fighting of father and mother. The child is a sensor. He can look through the window into the left ventricle. The pulmonary capillaries, the pulmonary capillaries, the window will give a pressure of the left ventricle. So that is regarding the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, pressure or pulmonary artery wedge pressure that will give an indication into the amount of ventricular filling or the preload. Now this can also be identified with the help of echocardiogram. The amount of filling of the ventricle can be seen or the left atrium and the left ventricle filling can be seen in the uh, echocardiogram and some idea regarding the preload can be obtained. Next parameter is cardiac output. Cardiac output we measure the how much the left ventricular motor is functioning towards the iota. So cardiac output is the stroke volume into heart rate. So how will we identify the stroke volume? Stroke volume can be again identified by echocardiogram where we get from the radius of the iota, radius of the left ventricular output tract and the velocity with which the uh, blood is pumping which, can, which we can identify from the Doppler. So stroke volume into heart rate will give the cardiac output. So the next parameter is coming is systemic vascular resistance. There is no direct measurement of systemic vascular resistance. Systemic vascular resistance can be measured by mean arterial pressure that is the mean arterial pressure in the artery. What is mean arterial pressure? Mean arterial pressure is 1 by systolic pressure plus 2 third of diastolic pressure. We can either calculate it like that or we can put an arterial line and do a continuous monitoring. So systemic vascular resistance is mean arterial pressure minus central venous pressure divided by cardiac output we have already measured divided by cardiac output into 80. 80 is for the conversion from the Woods unit that is millimeters per g per liter per minute into the metric units. So mean arterial pressure minus central venous pressure divided by cardiac output will give the systemic vascular resistance. So we have all the parameters now available for us. The central venous pressure, the preload, the cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. Central venous pressure from our central venous catheter, preload, from either echo or pulmonary capillary uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, pulmonary artery wedge pressure, cardiac output from uh, stroke volume into heart rate from echo, systemic vascular resistance by calculation. So how will we identify a hypovolemic shock? What happens to central venous pressure in hypovolemic shock? There is nothing here, right? Central venous pressure is measured here. So there is nothing here. The central venous pressure will be low. Again, preload. Nothing is reaching the ventric, uh, left ventricle. So preload will be low. Again, there is now no blood to come out. So cardiac output would be low. And what about the systemic vascular resistance? Since the since there is sympathetic simulation, the systemic vascular resistance, there will be vasoconstriction and the systemic vascular resistance will be high. Now coming to the next type of shock, obstructive shock. In obstructive shock, there is an obstruction uh, either by a, by a cardiac tamponade or there is a pulmonary thromboembolism or it can be due to a uh, tension pneumothorax where the right left atrium and the left ventricle left atrium and left ventricle is not filling due to some kind of obstruction internally or externally so in this model what happens to central venous pressure since there is an obstruction the blood is being pulled here the pressure will be high the central venous pressure will be high what happens to the preload no blood is reaching the heart so the preload will be low now what is regarding the cardiac output of course the cardiac output will be low and what about the systemic vascular resistance again there will be an increase in the systemic vascular resistance due to the sympathetic stimulation and vasoconstriction so that is regarding the parameters in obstructive shock now coming to the cardiogenic shock here the left ventricle is not functioning what happens to the central venous pressure here is an obstruction practically here is an obstruction so central venous pressure will be high what happened to the preload preload what happens preload will be high because the heart is not functioning the blood will just come to the heart and stay there. What about the cardiac output? Obviously, the cardiac output will be low. The heart is not pumping. And what regarding what about systemic vascular resistance? Again, no blood here. So, there will be sympathetic stimulation and vasoconstriction. So, systemic vascular resistance will be high. So, this is the picture of the hemodynamic parameters in cardiogenic shock. The next shock is distributive shock. What happens in the distributive shock? All the vessels are dilated. All the vessels are dilated. The systemic, the pulmonary, all the vessels are dilated. And due to this vasodilatation, the blood is pooled here and not much blood is reaching the heart. So what happens to the central venous pressure? Since the vessel is dilated, there is no pressure there. Even though there is blood, there is no pressure because the vessel wall is very much dilated. So central venous pressure will be low. What happens to the preload? Preload will again be low because there is no blood reaching the heart. Everything is pooled, pooled here. What about the cardiac output? 
cardiac output it can be low or high depending upon the clinical and scenario how much the blood is reaching the heart because the contractility of the heart will be normal but and the heart rate may be high but uh, the amount of blood will vary depending upon the amount of vasodilatation and what about the systemic vascular resistance here the systemic vascular resistance is classical because the systemic vascular resistance here you see there is uh, there is no resistance because everything is dilated every there is vasodilatation so this is the only condition in which the systemic vascular resistance will be low so that is regarding the distributive shock so hypovolemic shock so cvp will be low cardiac output and systemic uh, cardiac output will be low systemic vascular resistance will be high in obs uh, in obstructive shock CVP will be high, cardiac output will be low, systemic vascular resistance will be high. Okay. In cardiogenic shock, again, CVP will be high, cardiac output will be low, and systemic vascular resistance will be high as always. In distributive shock, what happens? The CVP will be low, vessels is dilated, cardiac output can be low or high, systemic vascular resistance is low. So, we see, you can easily distinguish between hypovolemic shock and distributive shock. But cardiogenic shock and obstructive shock appears similar. How to distinguish between this? In that case, we have to identify the, we need the pulmonary artery wedge pressure. So, or in obstructive shock, the preload will be low. Whereas, because uh, there is no blood reaching the heart due to obstruction, due to the pericardial terminate, the left atrium is not filling. Due to the left tension pneumothorax, the left atrium is not filling. Whereas, the cardiogenic shock, the heart is filled with blood. So, the preload will be high. So that is the importance of pulmonary artery wedge pressure or occlusion pressure to identify the preload and differentiate between these shocks. Obviously in hypovolemic shock the preload will be low and the distributive shock also the preload will be low because the blood is not reaching the heart. So that is regarding the different hemodynamic parameters and how to understand them in shock. Pulmonary artery wedge pressure, echocardiogram, arterial line. These may not be accessible immediately or practically and even CVP may be uh, taking time especially in a rural hospital rural tertiary care hospital then how will we diagnose that is the problem so i don't have cvp so look the don't forget about the preload we cannot do anything about it i don't have cvp then look for jvp if jvp is elevated think about obstructive or think about obstructive or cardiogenic shock low jvp we don't understand but if jvp is elevated think about obstructive or cardiogenic shock so, I don't know how to, we don't have an indication of cardiac output. I don't have the uh, echocardiogram to look for the uh, left ventricular output track and identify the stroke volume. So, then what will I do? Then I will look for the pulse volume. I will look for the dorsalis pedis pulse and see whether the heart rate, the heart is beating well. The heart rate and rhythm are normal. Then I will get an, uh, get an uh, indication into the amount of cardiac output, whether cardiac output is low or high. I don't have the, I don't know how to calculate the systemic vascular resistance. I forgot the formula or I, in case of a shock. So you just see the extremities, see whether the extremities are warm or cold. Then you have to, if it is a warm extremity, the systemic vascular resistance is low. If it is a cold extremity, there is vasoconstriction, the systemic vascular resistance is high. And by that you can identify a distributive shock. So then how will we identify between obstructive and cardiogenic shock? There you have to look for the chest specific causes. Heart sounds are muffled in pericardial tamponade. Air entry, tension pneumothorax, look for tension pneumothorax, just air entry. And in the ECG, you can look for S1, Q3, T3 pattern in case of a pulmonary thromboembolism. So, rule out the causes for the uh, obstructive shock. So, that is how we can identify the type of shock. And uh, in case of cardiogenic shock, these, there will be ECG changes. Look for myocardial infarction or other ECG changes. So, this, even without any other parameters, even without complex uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure or uh, echocardiogram, with our basic clinical investigations, we will get an indication into what type of shock it is. So, always when a patient comes, look at the, everything will be happen. One person will be putting airway, one person will be, two, two people will be putting uh, IV lines, one person may be putting central line, everything will be happen, happening. But you look for the, when you are in a decision making point, you gather all the inv invest, uh, investigation uh, information, look for the neck veins, heart sounds, you uh, auscultate for the heart sounds and the air entry, then uh, look for the peripheral pulses, see the extremities are warm or, warm or cold and gather all the information from the others, we will be made to, we will be able to identify the type of shock, the tree then institute the treatment as per the ATLS protocol.